afternoon meeting of the House Appropriations Committee on Wednesday, August 19th. Um, our chair, Kitty Toll, will be joining us very shortly, but in the meantime, we wanted to get started. Joining us this afternoon is the House Institutions and Corrections Committee. Uh, because we're taking testimony from the Department of uh, Buildings and General Services. And so we're delighted to have um, House Institutions and Corrections and BGS with us. And um, what I think I'd like to do is go quickly to the commissioner, but before I do, um, Representative Emmons, I wonder if you have any remarks that you would like to make before we begin our testimony. Well, I hadn't really thought of anything, but I would like to welcome BGS at the table. I know that there's going to be some changes at BGS uh, at the end of this week, so I'd like to wish Commissioner Cole the best of luck and enjoyment on his, um, I'm not going to call it retirement because I don't think you're going to fully retire. <laughs> I'm retiring but, from state service. Yes, yes. But I hope that it's a good venture for you and you will be missed. And good luck. And I know the committee wishes you the best. For Thank that. you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I uh, enjoyed my 10 years working for the executive branch and thereby working with you all at the legislature to move public policy forward under two different governors and a variety of different policy, uh, especially when it comes to BGS, which is more of the potpourri of state government um, where all the loose ends gather. And um, I've really enjoyed uh, working with you all throughout the years and um, I'm looking to finishing up uh, this week so I can move on to a new chapter in my own professional life, That's whatever great. that Thank may be. Great. Thank you, Chris. And also, I, I just want to let folks know that, you know, BGS is always under the radar. We never think, you know, many people think, well, it only takes care of our buildings. It only takes care of mowing the lawns, <laughs> that type of thing. And if we did not have the Department of Buildings and General Services, we would not be able to function as state government. They are the department that ensures that our employees have a safe work environment and that we can carry out the duties of state government. So, and I just want to acknowledge that for BGS, that they are such an integral department and they always go under the radar and no one thinks of them as being integral to the work of state government and providing services to Vermonters. So back to you, Mary. Yeah, thank you. And so commissioner, before we let you go ahead with your testimony, I want to remind the committees that what we're going to hear is a budget presentation for the full year. The um, documents that we're working from will be what was originally presented by the governor back in another life in January, as I understand it. Um, and um, while we passed a quarter year budget um, just a few weeks ago, what we're going to hear about today is the full year budget in what we did earlier has been incorporated into this. So what is up for consideration is the full FY21 budget, not a three quarter year budget. And I thought I, yeah, I see Kitty back, but I think she, um, I, we, we've done introductions, et cetera, Kitty, and I think we're ready to turn it over to the commissioner. Thank, thank you, Mary. And I apologize for I have a daughter getting ready to leave for school, so I don't want to talk about the chaos in my house right now on YouTube, but it's, <laughs> the are a little high right now, getting ready to drive to Michigan. Mm. Um, so put my mind at ease, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, you, there will be some rest areas available to you in the state of Vermont as you begin your journey. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to, uh, uh, for the record, Chris Cole, Commissioner of uh, Vermont State Department of Buildings and General Services, and I'd like to take this opportunity to um, introduce uh, 
various staff who are here on the call. Some I can see, some I can't. Uh, Jennifer Fitch, who is the Deputy Commissioner of BGS, and you have seen her on some occasions, she will be Acting Commissioner starting, um, starting Saturday. Uh, not Monday, Saturday. Welcome uh, aboard, Jennifer. Welcome. Thank you very much. Jennifer, if you don't know, uh, was a rising young star at VTrans as a project manager in the Accelerator Bridge program. I recruited her to be the de deputy uh, based on my previous work experience with her. She has exceeded my expectations in terms of coming up to speed and managing a complex department of BGS, and she will uh, excel uh, in her new role as acting commissioner. Uh, Eric Philcorn, principal assistant to the commissioner's office is on the call. You're all familiar with Eric. Jason Pienard, who is a financial analyst for AOA Financial Services. He, he prepares half of our uh, budget and it's divided up by programs, appropriation lines. He has some of the, the bigger ones. Uh, Sean Pienard, or Sean Benham, I don't see his name, but I think he's on the call as well. He's got the other half of our budget. Director of AOA Financial Services, Holly Anderson, is also on the call. And I apologize if I have missed anybody uh, from either BGS. Mark O'Grady may be on the call. I'm not sure. Uh, I can't see everybody's names. Um, but if we want to go ahead, Teresa, and put up the document, I can start taking the committee through our... Uh, proposed budget. Oh, I got to move my little thingy. Let's see. <laughs> Try it over there. Where do, where do you want to go? Uh, we'll start up at the top. I'm just trying to figure out how to put my little uh, box. If I can just, yeah, there we go. Um, so up at the top, this is the, uh, the administration. So this is the commissioner's office. And the, you're gonna see that um, we had budget targets of a 3% reduction for general fund or transportation fund uh, funded programs in the department or a 5% uh, reduction in ISF uh, funds. And I will go through each of the appropriations by program and uh, show you where we uh, made reductions when we could uh, to meet those targets. Uh, for the first appropriation, which is uh, the commissioner's office, there are, are really no um, opportunities for cuts because it's really just salaries or very, very few, if any, operating expenses uh, in this program. And so there's just really no budget change uh, for this program although it probably will accrue some vacancy savings uh, due to my position not being filled for a little bit. Um, so moving on to the next one, engineering. This program is the salaries and benefits of all of our project managers at BGS. And it is funded through the capital bill. And so uh, that bill has already passed uh, this is the number that was in that bill. So this is the number that goes into the uh, appropriation big bill. The next one is information centers. So this will take a little bit more of an explanation. Um, oh, I think you went a little too far. Because this is the copy center and I want to be the one just above it. Oh, keep going up. We're down, Teresa. I think we oh, have there a... There we go. Yep. That's it. Thank you. Uh, so the information centers, the first change is uh, ISF allocation reductions. And these are the uh, big statewide allocations, either from ADS or DHR. Uh, and this is our share of those uh, reductions for this particular program. Reduction in temporary uh, employee expense. We only have half of the centers open. They are using pretty much all of the permanent employees with the exception of possibly two and a couple of temporaries. And the rest of these are the savings in hours um, attributable to temporary employees who are not working uh, in the centers uh, that are currently open. We opened eight centers at hours 
from 10 in the morning till six at night. Those are the busiest peak travel times. The staffing levels change to where we've doubled up uh, staff for the duration because of the um, disinfecting and cleaning uh, enhanced that needs to go on. Um, the savings in this program, you'll see um, the change in third party services, the next change in order that really just shifts it from one fund to the other fund from the general fund to the T fund. So the savings is about 140,000, which represents our uh, budget target that we needed to bring this program in. We've just reestablished the program about a little over 30 days ago. We're still monitoring um, the demands placed on the staff and the cleaning and, and you know, all of the things that it takes to operate in compliance with the executive orders for social distancing and limitations on how many people we can have in this space. There's just a little bit more work involved in, in working with the public um, to, to meet those targets. You're going to notice uh, an increase in custodial portalette cleaning and an increase in, in portalette rental. When the rest areas were shut down, we needed to provide services for the truckers who were an essential service in terms of bringing food supplies and other goods to Vermont uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, that is part of our responsibility to the Federal Highway Administration to ensure that we have uh, facilities that the trucking uh, community can use to either rest or uh, restroom facilities and portalettes was the way to deliver that much needed uh, service to those essential workers. Um, and so that's where you see that $180,000 for both of them for this year uh, to maintain that. We have people who still come to rest areas without masks, who don't want to wear masks. Um, we don't allow them inside the building. Um, they're free to use the portalette. Um, so we need to not only maintain a presence at the centers that we did not open, but we still need to maintain a portalette presence at the centers that we did open. Uh, because we are only open for limited hours, 10 to 6, we do need to have the portalettes for those that are traveling um, outside of those hours. Any questions? Alice? I have a question. I have two questions, in fact. On the engineering costs, you said it was $4.1 million? No, it's, uh, four, yes, $4.1 million. We put in not quite three point eight in the capital bill. So I don't understand why, where that extra money is going to be coming from. Because we, we put in 3.735. Um, and you said the 4.1 million is coming from the capital bill for FY21. And I don't believe I've been checking with Catherine because she's also on here. Because I'm thinking, I, my mind said it was closer to 3.8. So I would question that one. Yep. And it, that, it, mm -hmm. it should, Madam Chair, you're, you're exactly right. It should match. Uh, this amount should match what was provided in the capital bill because that is the source of funds. So that would be my first question. My second question is for the rest areas with the increase in the custodial and then the rental of the portalettes for 360,000. Is there any dollars uh, for that coming from either FEMA or any of the COVID dollars that you've been working? Because previous testimony to our committee when we were in session back in May and June was indicated that BGS is getting some dollars through FEMA as well as some COVID dollars. Would any of those dollars cover this? Our, our guidance to, to BGS is to track uh, both our expenditures that are potentially, that are COVID related um, on additional things we're doing for the response uh, as well as people's time who have been focused on, on COVID. Uh, as to whether or not it ultimately gets paid for out of CRF or out of uh, FEMA dollars. I'm, 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 to be honest, I'm, I don't know if this is an eligible activity being reimbursed from FEMA, um, but the proposal from 
uh, finance and management is to um, include these expenses in the CRF funds. So that's that's what you see before you today. So the, I can't see the top column, Chris. So where the 360 is, is that column CRF column? Is that yes, it, column? yes, it is, Madam Chair. So those are being covered by yes. uh, CRF dollars, Alice. The three that's proposal, yes. Okay. Thank I you. couldn't see the top either because I'm on the iPad, so everything is scrunched. Okay. Yep. Okay, thank you. I was hoping to find a little fun funding there, but it would have been not uh, GF dollars anyway, right? Yeah. B B BGS is a very hard place to go looking for funding. <laughs> for G for B for especially for GF. Yeah, we're mostly internal service funds. But okay. this is one of the the, so, the funded departments, and it, it's really the uh, it's really these portalette costs that have really uh, impacted this particular budget. But you know, aside from the portalettes, uh, we did meet the budget target in terms of cutting back the program costs. Um, you know, and it, it pr wasn't that hard to achieve since they haven't been open uh, for a while. Okay, are we finished with the information centers and moving? Any other questions on that section from anyone? I'm not seeing any, Chris, so where would you like to go? Uh, whatever is next, which I guess is the copy center. Yep, purchasing. So purchasing, uh, this is an interesting story. So it, this its budget target is the 38,372. Uh, you have the ISF allocations, and then this 31,000. So we have a prior year carry forward from last year, and we're implementing the e-procurement project, which is an enterprise level project, which is gonna affect all of state government and improve our contracting processes and, and ability to use state contracts. In order to, to have that program up and running after the software is completed, the next step is generally downloading all your contracts and all your forms and, and, and it's called the catalogs. And you have to pay a vendor separate from that because we didn't include it in the original project costs. We had a, a vendor uh, uh, picked out and they were awarded the contract. And I think the contract was around, I don't know, 120,000. And uh, when the, when COVID-19 hit, it put this e-procurement e project on hold and it gave Deb DeMore, our director of uh, purchasing and contracting, an opportunity to reach out to some of the vendors who were impacted by COVID. And this particular one who had the catalog contract, um, she informed them that we needed, still needed the catalog work, but we were only able to pay half as much to get it. And she successfully negotiated that deal and so we're still getting all the catalog work that we wanted, but at half the price. And for doing that, I'm uh, making that, those funds available to her program so she doesn't have to lose a position. Um, since she created the savings and did it to meet this uh, targeted need, that's where those funds are gonna come from. And so they're technically from carry forward funds that were gonna be used to fulfill a contract. Since that contract's gonna cost half as much, we're gonna use a portion of those carry forward funds for this uh, purpose. So that's so our we recommendation. See, we see the down here, we'll see the up <clears throat> in another budget. No, there is, there is no up, just well, down. He's going to use, uh, use a portion of the 31,000? Correct. It's a already, it's from a carry forward plan. So she received carry forward authority last year because she had a, a position that was going to go into the program. It didn't, right. we didn't hire the position. And so in, we approved the use of the funds for the catalog for the ZPRO program. And so n not uh, getting the same catalog work at half the price is how she generated the savings. And the save and the original money came from her carry forward from the previous year. Okay, so the thirty-one thousand is not the total of the vacancy savings. It's it's the remainder that's left after she uses the portion she needs. Yes, no. we're yeah. citing vacancy savings, but if she doesn't achieve the vacancy say, the save the vacancy savings, we have a backstop in terms of the savings she created within this contract. 
Okay, thank you. Yep. And the next one, I believe, might be the copy center. Postal, did you already do postal? I'm at purchasing and whatever comes next after purchasing. It, it's at the bottom, postal. I can't see it though, because I have the, the your faces at the bottom. So all I can see is purchasing. Uh, now I can see copy center. Thank you. Uh, okay. So we're skipping postal. I can do postal. <laughs> I just can't see the top of it. There we go. Nope. It's I, let me, all right, just keep it there, Teresa, and I will move I my- I can't move it because it flips. I'll move my box. Page. All right, it's now between, your face It's is, between two pieces of paper, yeah. I got it now. Postal Center, ISF allocation reductions of 4,625, vacancy savings, 6820, and this reallocation of program supervisory staff. So this, the Postal Service, the Postal Center is in part of BGS that's called Government Business Services. And these programs have a director. There are three program supervisors and the programs are postal, print, surplus property, and, uh, state and federal surplus property and the fleet program. And they're all managed by uh, one director and they each have program managers or supervisors. And we're reallocating the director's time we had a position that we had approved for the surplus program. It was a limited surplus position. It was in our budget previously, uh, but we have worked out a way uh, between different uh, programs within BGS to not have to hire that limited service position. And part of these um, reallocation of program supervisory staff, that is the manager and the director. Um, it are being moved around to focus a little bit less time on some of the areas and more time on surplus property. And the reason why they're going to spend more time on surplus property, they're going to, they're managing the gun sales program. And that's where that, those sales emanate out of surplus property. So you're going to see an up in surplus property and a down in the other programs they manage that I mentioned. And so that's the tale of the postal center. Are there questions? Okay, Chris, I'm not seeing questions. So we'll move on from the Postal Center to the print is small for fleet management. No. Fleet, fleet manage, uh, print. So the next one's print. There are ISF allocation reductions. And then again, this reallocation of program supervisory staff away from this program uh, and over to the surplus program. So all these reductions will add up to one big up when we get to surplus. But that's the, the, the print program. Fleet management, uh, ISF allocation reductions, uh, vacancy savings. We're either gonna use uh, uh, furloughs or fund balance if we don't get any vacancy savings. This, this ISF fund as you may recall, has a positive fund balance in excess of the value of the assets that we have borrowed uh, from the treasurer to, uh, to purchase. So uh, we still have a little bit of money that we could take out of that uh, fund balance um, if necessary, but it's a small amount, only 14,953. Uh, again, the reallocation of program supervisory staff away from this program and over to surplus and then 50% reduction of travel expense line items for 976 and that gets us to that budget target. And then the state surplus, if there are no questions about fleet, I'll move on to state surplus. The state surplus program, you see the ISF allocation reductions. Here is the removal of the new limited service position that was in our previous budget. So it comes out of this one. And then you see the reallocation of program supervisory staff to support the gun sale program. And that's the up from the collection of all those other downs from the allocations of the other programs we just went through. And then vacancy savings, furloughs, or fund balance likely to required to meet the target. And the state surplus program also has a positive fund balance. Um, so that won't be any problem to meet that 32,000 if we don't achieve the vacancy savings. Any questions there for, from folks? How much is your fund balance, Commissioner? 
Um, I don't know. Jason would have that answer. And some of it's committed. So the fund balance uh, we're using to fund um, the part of the federal program. And it's being used also to fund a portion of an IT project um, we have relating to the gun sales program, which is an inventory uh, management project. I don't think we've settled on a system. We're evaluating other systems the state uses for other programs to see if they can be applicable and, and work for ours. Um, Jason, do you know the, 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 there are the fun This balance. is Sean, Commissioner. Um, I can jump in with this one. Uh, last year, uh, fiscal year 19 ended with 450,000 in surplus. Um, we haven't finalized this year's numbers, obviously. Um, we'll probably lose a little bit in that fund, but it'll, it'll be three to $400,000 in surplus still. Thank you. And are the funds in that fund um, fungible? <laughs> Do you under, I, can they be transferred and used for other other purposes? Or are they? Um, I'm not thinking of the proper word. Are, are they? May they only be used for specific purposes? I don't know the answer to that question. Does Sean? No, I'm, I'm not sure technically. I think traditionally we've left them in the fund. Um, like the commissioner was saying, the, the intent I think was to, and it has been to, to support that IT development project that, that we're gonna be um, taking on this year. We, we could look into this though, transferability. Okay. So they, they were raised specifically for the IT project? No, no okay. they weren't raised specifically for that. This is one of the ISF programs that uh, does well. So you remember there, there are two surplus programs, one's federal and one state. The federal one you know, loses money and the state really doesn't receive any benefit from the federal surplus program. The benefit goes to the municipalities, which is why we manage it uh, for them. That, that program loses money. So the state surplus program you know, fund balance uh, you know, as we allocate back and forth between the two programs, because it's the same people that operate and manage both programs, you know, we tend to, 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 to address some of the fund balance that way. But, you know, we, we, we sell a lot of stuff through the state surplus program, and we don't really have an inventory control system, as you would think for somebody that runs a retail operation. And then when we receive the responsibility of selling uh, guns, through the state surplus program, uh, we, uh, I felt at that time um, to ensure that um, our inventory control system was robust, we needed, a, we needed a, a, a database that tracks things that come into the inventory, that sit in our possession, and then go out of the inventory, and where did they go to? Um, we're running this program uh, in compliance with federal regulations, utilizing um, federally licensed gun dealers. And it's important to have a really good inventory control system that can produce reports that can document where these uh, firearms have gone. And so um, we're still doing our due diligence to see if there's anything that we could pick up that the state already owns, like uh, liquor control has an inventory control system and we're evaluating that with our staff as to what, if any of these could be applicable to us. Um, and so I don't know how much of that fund balance we would need, but as commissioner, I feel very strongly that that investment should be made given the criticality of you know, the property that we're selling out of the surplus program. I understand, thank you. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, next. Um, the next the next is the uh, federal surplus program. I think you can Representative see Helm had a question. Oh, oh I'm yep. sorry, I didn't look. His hand is up. Representative Helm, sorry. Hey, got my act together, you know. <laughs> can I just go back just for a second, Chris? The yep. gun program. Yes, sir. Um, so you sell 
you take in state police guns, whatever they are, and you then have an auction or something to only to gun dealers or to the public? Just to just to the only eligible people under the state statute we can sell to are federally licensed gun dealers. Whether they okay. reside in the state of Vermont or they reside outside the state of Vermont, then we hold an auction. Uh, the federally licensed gun dealers with their federally licensed number sign up for the auction and they bid on uh, the guns. They go in uh, 20 gun lots. So, you know, the state police and local police have been hanging on to guns for a long time. And, you know, some of them are from the 1960s and 70s, you know, with those small Bushnell scopes that you remember when they first came out with those um, to, you know, guns that are been confiscated recently. And so there's a real mix in there and we do it in lots so that uh, some of them aren't worth much. Some of them are worth quite a bit. And each gun lot, you get a little bit of everything in it. And then they okay. resell to the public. So, right. Okay. So one more little question. In years past, Fish and Wildlife, for instance, would come up with a handful every year. Yep. Do you do all guns in the state, including theirs, or just state police and and you know police type guns? Um, there's a provision in the statute that uh, the commissioner of Fish and Wildlife can take possession of any of the guns that I have in m m my possession if they're useful for their education programs. I don't recall, to be honest with you, uh, Representative Helm, uh, whether or not what what the Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife is authorized to do with guns that they come under their possession. And well, I have the auction them. And I they haven't received them themselves. Yeah, I'm they sorry. may still do that. I I I I don't think that was addressed in the the statute that was created th yeah. three years ago for us to sell or two years ago for BGS to sell guns. I, okay. don't, I don't think that was an entity the guns, from. The guns that they got usually weren't worth very much anyway. So well, thank you, Chris, for that. You're Appreciate welcome. It. You're welcome. The federal surplus program is a reduction of $360. You can see this as an appropriation of 7,200 to keep the lights on. Uh, the next one is a property management program. This is the program that manages all the leases in the state of Vermont. Um, there are ISF allocation reductions. This is the one, um, uh, but one program within BGS's budget where we are recommending uh, the elimination of a position. So a reduction in force. Uh, there are vacancy savings. And then there is an increase in the cost of leases. And the increase in the cost of leases, this 1.5 million is directly related to the state leasing additional space to respond to COVID. Uh, some of these leases are for medical surge sites and some of these leases are for um, AHS um, clients, um, homeless, um, off the street during the pandemic and a place to stay, um, those types of things. Um, and you'll see that these are in the CRF uh, bucket. And I can provide you with a listing of the, the leases and in, in where they are. I have a email somewhere, but I can't minimize anything once the screen's been taken over. So uh, I can get you that information if that is of interest to you. Uh, I, this is Representative Jessup. Commissioner, I would welcome that information. Yeah, Thank you. Please. You're welcome. Okay, so Commissioner, if you send it to um, Teresa, then she'll get it out to us or to um, Phil. Um, any other questions, folks? I'm not seeing any hands. Um, what, can you tell us, Commissioner, the consequence of the reduction? Uh, you said that you're having a riff. 
It's a, it's a I don't want to get right into the details of the position um, because obviously we ha we don't talk to our employees until you have finalized your budget. Um, but uh, it's a position that uh, performs work that is not, um, not in the core work that we do. We're not quite sure why we have the position. Uh, we find use for the skills from time to time, uh, especially around COVID, but it's not the, a bread and butter position of the department. And um, uh, we really don't need it. And okay. that was a way to meet the budget target and, um, and keep our program intact. This will have no impact to the property management program or how we uh, manage leases, or how we provide customer service to the other departments who are in lease space. It isn't connected to the property management program or goals in any way. Okay, that, that is what we needed to know is in terms of programmatic impacts and your testimony is there are none. None. Yeah. There are okay. other state employees and other departments uh, that can provide this service to BGS if we needed it. And we have used other departments for this service when we needed, uh, when we have needed it. So it's basically a, a, a design services but not building um, design, more graphic. Yeah. And my recollection is that when you came to the department, you had a view that we needed to be moving more into uh, government owned um, property rather than in leased property and just, as you leave us, I am curious if you have um, continued to have that view and if you've seen the savings that I believe you hoped that we would achieve. I continue to have that view, but uh, we have not, we have not, we have not achieved the savings that I hoped we would achieve. We've, we have achieved savings um, but n not in the manner that you just presented it. So, you know, when we had the National Life fire, we renegotiated that lease with National Life and that produced savings for the state of Vermont because we got a better rate than what we had before the fire. Mm -hmm. um, when we moved the Agency of Transportation to that lease building in, in downtown Barrie, we, we got uh, savings for the state of Vermont because we renegotiated a better lease terms for the state of Vermont. Um, you know, we're going through a similar exercise right now in the Capitol Complex, uh, where we are m moving departments around, utilizing state-owned space to a greater degree uh, with the hope of, you know, r reducing a lease. And, uh, the, and there would be two leases we would be, two or three leases we'd be reducing. The Capitol Complex move alone, if it continues, um, will save the state of Vermont $2 million over a 10 year period in operating costs and, and $1 million if we do end up selling um, some Baldwin Street properties. And so uh, we're continuing to do this. We're establishing a team internal to BGS with an outside consultant to review our state owned space, look for opportunities to invest some money uh, to, um, increase the capability of those spaces. For example, we have a project that never really got off the ground. It was really expensive. It was a complete redo of the Supreme Court building, you know, and it was a $25 million project. And it, it just never advanced through the weight of its own cost. But the component of the projects that we should do are the stacks, the connector space and replacing the uh, elevator so employees don't get stuck in there. And uh, those are the types of projects I think BGS in the next five years are going to be advancing for your consideration. Projects that seek to spend a smaller amount of money rather than building a new building to rehabilitate some space and 
create opportunities to do just what you said, Representative, to, to reduce our reliance on leases. And um, that's going to be a five to 10 year project. And, and you guys are gonna be really in the best position um, to see that that thing has legs and it, and it keeps continuing. So I really appreciate the question. And I know the deputy commissioner will look forward to reporting on BGS its success in the future in doing just that. Because uh, one thing the pandemic has taught us, we, we don't need all of the physical space that we have. And we should be working to reduce that space and creating different opportunities for people to work and have touchdown spaces, hoteling spaces, et cetera. And slowly over the next 10 years, reduce our reliance on state-owned space and maybe take some of these state-owned office buildings if we decide we don't need them all and you know, sell them to a developer and convert them to housing because we do need housing in the state. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Um, are there any other questions on property management until we've been not seeing any hands? Um, so moving on to, I think it's fee for space is next yes. and last. Yep. This is, uh, this is our biggest uh, line item in our budget. It's a $31 million program. Um, this pays for the largest number of employees in the BGS budget, our operations and maintenance employees. There's approximately 240 of them spread over six districts uh, across the entire state. Um, they are our frontline employees. They're some of our hardest working employees. These are the employees that take care of our antiquated state buildings and keep them running no matter what. And um, a tip of the cap to these hardworking BGS employees that really are um, the face of BGS to all the other departments and agencies. And these are the people that I receive emails from on a weekly basis extolling uh, their good work that they have done on behalf of another department. And so I just want to acknowledge the hardworking men and women in this particular program. Uh, ISF allocation reductions, uh, 112,000 uh, for this particular program. And those are just the same reduction, same formula spread across the programs. Vacancy savings, 413. This shouldn't be too difficult to achieve. It just took us a whole year to hire a plumber in the Southwest uh, district or Southeast district. Um, and so, <laughs> Uh, there is a, 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 a hiring a freeze going on, and um, this program still gets uh, employees hired, though, because they're taking care of our buildings, which are still um, operating. Uh, reduction in temporary employee expense. We've uh, got rid of our intern program, and we uh, eliminated our temporary employees um, so we saved 80,000 uh, there. Reduction in other contract and third party expense, window washing, we're not doing window washing this year, that's $75,000 saved. Uh, reduction in snow removal expense, don't haul the snow after each storm. So we're gonna, we're gonna pile it up and, um, and uh, have it trucked away a couple of days after the storm. You pay a premium, you know, right after each storm because all the limited trucks are working to clear all the lots. And if you can wait a couple of days, you'll pay less. Um, so we're going to try that strategy, which is how BGS used to do it. And that's uh, it's gonna save 65,000. And then we're going to save $700,000. Uh, Joe Asia, who is our director of design and construction, who manages the projects in the Capitol bill, did an examination of the fee for space expense programs and identified costs in the plumbing and heating system repair, as well as repair and maintenance to buildings in the, in the fee for space accounts that could legitimately be part of the major maintenance program. The, the reason why they're not is the supervisors who sign these invoices, it's just easier for them to bill it to the fee for space program where they have all the expense codes rather than having to get an expense code from Joe Asia, the director 
uh, who manages the capital bill expenses. And so Joe is going to take this on himself and work with the directors uh, to ensure these, these projects get in the right bucket. And we hope to save uh, 700,000 from the fee for space program uh, by uh, funding it out of major maintenance where these project expenses uh, legitimately can belong. Uh, and then you may I ask you to pause there? I'm, I'm sure. not seeing anybody from corrections and institutions pop up on this, but is this simply shifting a cost from um, the general fund or for the internal service charges mm -hmm. to um, the capital bill? And does that then reduce the amount of money that's available for? major maintenance, which has been an ongoing concern. You can tell I used to be on that committee, so I've been yes. to ask this question. This, this, is a, this is something that the department has done previously before in other tight operating environments when the department has been requested to reduce the fee for space program. If you think about the fee for space program and you think about the other you know reductions we've got a hundred thousand in heating oil uh, a reduction in auto expenses but then we got these increases uh, you know which total 1.5 million which are directly all related to covid the biggest one being security services so it's really challenging to uh, reduce expenses in an operating budget. You know, if your operating scenario doesn't change, we're really dependent upon the weather. How cold is it gonna be? That relates to that heating expense. Uh, how much snow do we get? That relates to our snow contracts as well as um, overtime and, and things of that nature. So it's a hard budget. This is uh, the only way that I could come up with, uh, Madam Chair, um, to achieve $1.5 million in savings was to shift 700,000 of it to the capital bill, which are legitimate capital bill expenses. And as I explained, uh, it's the supervisors for this program because they work in the fee for space program. They're just used to putting all of their expenses in the fee for space program. We're going to um, work with them on things that are eligible for the capital bill and could be funded out of major maintenance if they would just ask Joe for the funds. So they are legitimate major maintenance expenses. It, we're going to make the process a little bit more administratively difficult for them so we can get the funds in the right bucket. If they would come to Joe and say, I've got a $40,000 plumbing project and I'd like some major maintenance money, he'd give them the money but they're just billing it to fee for space. So we're just changing our process a little bit. I wouldn't characterize it as less investment in the buildings. The investment's going to occur, uh, but we are going to be displacing some fee for space dollars that could have legitimately been put in the major maintenance program. Thank you. Representative Edmonds has a question. Thank you, Mary, for asking the question that you did because I was going to ask that same question Fee-for-space, um, it's a quagmire when you start asking any questions about fee-for-space, but isn't that some of the intent of fee-for-space dollars, that it goes towards the maintenance of that building? Uh, yes, but typically they're for expenses $3,500 or less. Anything that's over $5,000 is under the state's definition of what's a capital expense qualifies as a capital expense. So 5,000 and up is a major maintenance expense, uh, 35 and below, you know, 5,000 and below really is fee for space. So, so it I is- just, No, go ahead, Chris. It, it is for uh, maintenance, as you mentioned, but it's not what we would call major maintenance. So I, I guess protecting our capital budget, just to be clear right now in this particular presentation, um, we have almost, I don't know if you want to go with the 3.7 that we put in the capital bill for engineering or that 4.1 for engineering plus the 700,000. That's uh, almost a $4.8 million pressure onto the capital bill that the bill is that we are picking up on an ongoing basis. And our bonding capacity is going to be decreasing over the next few years. So it's just an added pressure 
Um, and I just want to make that statement. And Mary, again, I thank you for raising that because you took the words right out of my mouth. I didn't have a chance to raise my hand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. And so this, it, it, the point of us having this joint conversation is for us to hear this together. And um, when we get to the end of the presentation, we'll have a conversation about the two committees communicating with each other and you're informing us of your um, view of the actions mm -hmm. that we should be taking here. So that can be on your list. Right, correct. Right. What you want to do. I have a question. Oh, are you back? Yeah, I can't raise my hand, so. I can't see you. I'm okay, sorry. I, please I, go. I can't raise my and hand. you're in charge again. Well, I don't need to do that. But my question is, the capital bill has gone and has been passed. So how will this $700,000 be reflected on the current year capital bill? And maybe that was uh, addressed when I was um, it, it, it it, it, as the description says, it's going to shift costs from fee for space to major major maintenance. Plumbing and heating systems repair will be about four hundred thousand, and then repair and maintenance to buildings the other three hundred thousand. So uh, it will come directly out of the capital bill and and fund these projects. So we're basically saying we have seven hundred thousand dollars worth of projects that have been in the fee for space program that are eligible for the capital bill under the states definition of capital assets and we want to move the projects we're going to want to fund a portion of the fee for space program with the capital bill to take care of these projects and basically it's it's funding them directly out of the capital bill and i understand that but wasn't the funding within the capital bill already assigned for for, for certain functions is this some things won't happen then so major maintenance is a sort of a catch-all for projects that we do that are repair and rehabilitation projects that are in excess of $5,000 to a variety of buildings. And those, that project list isn't developed until we get the appropriation from the legislature, traditionally the second week of May. So the, the money is there, the projects haven't been spoken for. So you can create the capacity for these by not addressing other things that you may have. Correct. And, 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 to, the, and, to, okay. and to the vice chair and to, um, and to Representative Hooper and Representative wow. Point, they are correct. We will be spending uh, $700,000 less on our buildings because we're not gonna be using fee for space money to do it, but it was a way uh, for me to develop a budget in keeping with the budget targets that were given to me. Thank you. And I understand, and I'm sorry I missed that earlier uh, explanation. So let's continue, Chris. I don't see any other hands. That is the uh, end of my budget presentation. Um, and, and just for my own clarification, Teresa, could you pop that chart back up? So um, there's, as with... Um, uh, another budget that we heard from earlier, uh, the Agency of Digital Services, the general fund, the $60,000 reduction is the 3% target that was given to you by the administration for general fund, is that? Correct, 3% for a general fund and transportation fund and 5% for ISF funds. And that's the 1.815. The 5.8% is, I can't see the top column. I can't so see the top, so I can't, I can't. But that uh, is, yeah. that, that's the internal, okay, I'll, okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. And those are, and those are to meet the three, the targets that you were given. That is correct. Thank you. Um, any questions uh, from the committee? Representative Taylor. Uh, yes, Commissioner, you know, I um, take an interest in the corrections feasibility study that's, uh, been there, there was an RFP for. I'm wondering whether any of these changes affect the ability of that to continue uh, on its schedule and get done by the end of December. I don't know about the schedule, but none of these budget changes impact that project in any way. Good. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? Am I not seeing any other questions? Um, so um, Chris, what we have been doing since we're meeting uh, with, a, with a two joint committees, 
we have been taking 15 minutes to clarify any questions and concerns and um, and scheduling when we'll get feedback because as you know, we're on a pretty fast train to get a budget out. And um, you are more than welcome to stay, you and Jennifer and the rest of your team uh, to, to hear that part of the conversation or you're, you're welcome at this point to leave. But again, I wanna say on uh, for myself and on behalf of our, our committee, thank you for your service to the state. You've certainly done your years and uh, contributed greatly and we're going to be sorry to see you go, but I'm hoping for fun things. I hope you're going to uh, have a, uh, your next uh, adventure is going to be uh, rewarding and we look forward to having Jen uh, join us as the head of your team. So thank you very much. And I would, I would uh, echo your comments back to yourself. Thank you very much for your public service in leading what is one of the toughest committees in the uh, legislative process. And the House really does set the budget for uh, the Senate and you guys do the in-depth work and really dig into it. And um, I've really we enjoyed you on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's just common knowledge. Uh, I've really enjoyed working with this particular committee uh, through the years. You ask really good questions and you're uh, fair and balanced and you really treat the people that come before your committee with respect. And I do appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you. Best wishes to you. Thank you very much. And so Alice, what we have been um, asking um, other committees, we've already had uh, several um, joint committees that um, we don't need a formal letter that cites specific uh, sections in, um, in the budget bill or statute or what we need is an informal memo from you when your committee has had time to review all of this information um, stating to us <clears throat> what your concerns are or what you agree with or how uh, you may like to see things done differently. And so the, the three pieces, we've seen the 3% um, the reductions within the general fund and the transportation fund. And if there's policy concerns you have there, we'd like to know what those are. And within the 5% reductions in the internal service fund, obviously there's a $700,000 shift to the capital bill um, that um, I'm sure that mm -hmm. Way on, weigh in on. We do have uh, two public hearings next week on Thursday and Friday. The one on Thursday is at five o'clock and the one on Friday is at one o'clock. And so we won't be making any firm decisions public and, and, hear from okay. and Adam, you may want to mute yourself because we're listening to your conversation. I just don't. Uh, and um, so you may want to join in and Teresa will send out a link to those uh, uh, public hearing so that we know what Vermonters are thinking about this budget. But after that, the following week, if we could get an informal memo and, yeah. and decide on things, send them out to us. We don't have to wait for a memo that, you know, encompasses all parts of, of areas that you want to weigh in on. When you make decisions on something, the sooner we get it, um, mm -hmm. the sooner um, we can expedite this budget out and get it to the House floor. And uh, Peter, this is yours. So you'll connect with Alice when they're having these discussions. And Peter, I, I would just say, I'm in the process right now of working with my committee assistant to figure out next week. Sure. Um, and I'm sort of thinking it might be Tuesday. We meet Tuesday morning from 8.30 to 10. Okay. So seeing that this, I think the BGS budget is pretty straightforward compared to the DOC budget. And if I'm speaking out of line for the committee, please committee members uh, speak up. But I think we can deal with the BGS budget pretty quickly next week. And I would like to see if we can bring you in for a little bit on Tuesday morning. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. And I know, okay, great. And Phil, I know you're on this uh, video, so maybe we can work with Peter and, and uh, it won't be Chris, it will be Jennifer. <laughs> to come in and Eric. <laughs> Good. We uh, um, whoops, Alice, I don't want to cut you off. No, nope, that's fine. I said that that's how we're going to proceed for next Tuesday. Great. Uh, Butch has a question. We have three questions. We have Butch, Diane, and Mary. Uh, Representative Shaw. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, <clears throat> time out. Go by. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, it's not a dry cough. Yeah. Butch, do you want me to come back to you, or are you all he set? Was... <laughs> I yeah, think he wants to come back. Come back. OK, uh, Diane and then Mary. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I just wanted to check on something, and I don't know if it involves CGS, but it, it can't help. But, but I know that it definitely involves house institutions and corrections. I do believe that today is the due date for the space study on the, on the state house. You know, so I've been watching for a, a flash of that. I just didn't know if that was on your radar or if that has come out or, or if that involves BGS as input. I think they hired uh, somebody to do it. Yeah. So, Diane, are you asking that of our committee, or are you asking that of the commissioner? Well, I was. I, I wasn't sure if I should ask the commissioner or if I should ask you where where it would be coming from. Well, my committee is going to be looking at it uh, for sure. Probably next yeah. week. We're meeting on Tuesday and Thursday, so that might be one of the first things on Thursday because we'd have to okay. coordinate with Freeman French and Freeman. Okay. And, be, and, and I was going to, and I thank you for asking this, Diane, because that was rattling throughout my brain whether to ask Chris this or not. Decided okay. not to, but Chris, I don't know if you can weigh in on any of this. I, I think, you know, the, the, the study was uh, done by Freeman, French Freeman. Uh, they, I, and this is, we're talking about the original State House study, not, not the State House study the legislature is involved in now, right? We're talking about the original one or the one now, the COVID one now. The COVID one now for yeah. relocating us. Oh well, okay. we're not really we're, we're not really part of that study. We're we're assisting uh, the Sergeant of Arms Office and Freeman French Freeman <laughs> request for uh, building blueprints and uh, things like that. We we've, we've given them a couple of possibilities that we knew about such as the Vermont College of Fine Arts and Barry Auditorium and things like that, but we're not involved in the the day-to-day -day of the study. We're in a more of a support role upon the quest. So I, I could actually, if I, I Steve Klein, I could jump in and just give you an update if you want. I, it's, uh, um, this, I saw, it's due today, and I saw a, a near, near final draft. I think it's going through um, proofing as we speak. I think it'll be out later today or tomorrow at the latest. Um, it is everything you say. It's basically a, a discussion of options, um, leads to questions about, uh, you know, legislators make determinations of what they do as far as how remote, how how much in person. And it gives you, it does exactly what Chris has pointed out is right. It looks at all the different space in the area and makes a bunch of suggestions, but it should be out by the, I'm hoping by the end of the day, later, uh, Catherine Benham's the one in our office working on it with the Sergeant Arms and uh, Freeman French. Um, but you're correct, it, it's on a very, this is the point where the study should be out. Thank you, Steve, for that update. We'll be looking forward to seeing where legislature will be held <laughs> in, um, in January. Hopefully that will help guide us. Mary, you had a question, and then we'll go back to Representative Shaw. Mary, you have to unmute yourself, or let's see. There you, go. you are, you're good. Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, we had had a discussion about the fund balance in the surplus property, and I would, I, wanted to suggest to corrections and institutions that they may want to take a look at that and see if that, well, that's one-time money, if any of that could be accessed to mitigate other reductions elsewhere. Again, I don't know what the restrictions are on the fund or if that would be appropriate, but it just strikes me as worth following up on. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Representative Shaw. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So, uh, not to, not for today, but but maybe when uh, when Peter comes in uh, next week or Jen or somebody, I'd like to understand more of how the uh, uh, the CRF funding uh, relates to the reduction in the budget and and the what ifs uh, that uh, are are involved in that. Um, and so, but it, it, I think it's a fairly long conversation that 
take some explanation and may or may not have some risks. So I'd like to understand those. Thank you, thank you, Butch. We'll be doing a lot of CRF work um, generally, which this would be part of. And, um, uh, you know, to learn about the uses of it and any, um, any changes that may need to be made. Um, and uh, some of that may, may, may uh, be reflected in the budget bill or maybe in a separate bill. There may be an earlier CRF bill for things that, that need to get out right away. And so there will be several CRF conversations going on. But as far as BGS specific, Chris, when you and Jen go into um, um, uh, corrections and institutions, um, you'll have more information for Butch at that time, I'm assuming. No, thank you. I don't see um, any other questions. Um, I, just because I keep forgetting, I do want to give a quick shout out to uh, Representative Iacoboni, who was recognized for a lifetime achievement um, in prevent child abuse. And uh, that's quite an honor. And I, I just don't want to forget it. And we have a nice uh, audience group of people here. And you should be um, very proud of the work you've done. And, and <laughs> congratulations, Dave. Well done. So we are going to take a quick break. We're back on at 2.45 uh, to start. Um, uh, we have the Chancellor of the State Colleges in and we will hear some testimony and have an opportunity to fully understand. Um, I don't know if we, in, in an hour we can fully understand the picture of what life is like going back to colleges and what the financial uh, outlook is uh, for the state colleges. Uh, in the new planning that, that is happening. But we are going to start that conversation Madam, after, after. Yeah, 2.15, we just have a few minutes. Yeah, 2.15, <laughs> so uh, we're going okay. to and have a quick break. Bob, you have a question? Nope, your hands No, up. I just wanted to clear that up because I've got 2.15 here. So 2.15, yeah. <laughs> uh, did I say 2.45? Yes. <laughs> 2.15, 2.15. And uh, in the meantime, I'll get my house in order, getting a child off to college because it is not, it's not a fun time right now, I'll tell you. Six minutes, Kitty. <laughs> what is that? I'm gonna stop the live stream now. Please.